test. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the family is here. As they close the casket, I'm going to ask all of the program, program participants to please be seated to my left as I face, but over by the podium so that we won't have to walk far. We're about to process in. I just want to make sure of all the program participants will see, be seated on this left, far left side, if you will.
Shall we stand to receive the family? For Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he may live, though he may die, he shall yet live. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall stand he knows on the earth. My name. Though after my skin is destroyed. He knows my name. Yet in my flesh. He knows my name. He knows my name. And oh, how he walks with me. And oh, how he talks with me. And oh, how he tells me that I. You know my name. You know my name. You know my name. You know my name. You know
God bless you. You may be seated. My friends, we have brought nothing into this world. And it is certain that none of us will carry from this world anything. The Lord has given us the life of Cecil Maurice Exum. And now the Lord in his holy writ has decided to take him away. Let the church say amen. amen. We have gathered today to celebrate. I want to emphasize celebrate the life of Cecil Maurice Exum. Amen. We want to continue to celebrate because he is worth and was worth celebrating. The family has provided an outline. We're going to bring up Dr. Carol Hayes Artis now who will take us through the remaining of our experience. Good morning, good afternoon, I guess I should say. First, let me start by saying I count it an honor, a final act of love for my best friend, Cecil Maurice Exum. Thank you, Miss Barbara, Aaron, Des, children, for allowing me to be a part of this ceremony, to be a part of this celebration, but more than anything, to be a part of your family. It is my honor, and I thank you. I woke up this morning with a scripture on my mind, because summertime is a time for planning, planning trips to Europe, for me planning summer school for the school district, Cecil and I planning trips to the Pizza Hut, but God delivered to me, for I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord, are thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not evil, to give you hope, hope in your final outcome. We're here today not for Cecil's final outcome, for his final days with us in the bodily spirit, but because he was so good, yes. no, because he was so great. I know what's going to happen next, because I have faith, and there is sadness in my heart, but there is joy. So what I ask for you is to celebrate him, but also pray for me. I'm trembling, and everybody in Goldsboro knows I'm a big crybaby. And I loved him. We will now have our hymn of comfort, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, as sung by Mr. Kevin Alston. Please join in. It is a wonderful uh, hymn, and I know it will lift us up. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace in mind leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all the law. Yes, I'm leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, 
meaning on the everlasting arm. Oh, how sweet to walk in his pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning on the everlasting arm Yes, I'm leaning on Jesus Leaning on Jesus Safe and secure from all day long Yes, I'm leaning on Jesus Leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arm. Yes, I'm leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from Jesus. I'm counting on you, Lord, and I thank you. I thank you right now. We will now have the Old Testament reading from Mother, Mother Jacqueline Harvey, followed by the New Testament reading from Reverend Gary Fisher. I do give honor to God, to my nephews, to everyone that's here, to the family. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, yes, sir. Cecil with my, my boom coon, sidekick. It's my nephew. I loved him. And you know, the scripture that I want to read is Psalms 23. I believe everybody know that. I was raised on Psalms 23, passed it down to my children, Andra and Mickey, they're here. Then I passed it down to my nephews, Cecil, Aaron, George, Greg, Roro, <laughs> pastors. Then I passed it down to my nieces, Pamela, Michelle, and Tanya. So I don't believe it's out of order that we would stand. Will you please stand? And let us all recite the 23rd Psalm. We ready? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his namesakes. Yea, though I walk through the valley, shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepare for table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. God bless you.
Good afternoon. I do greet you in the name of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Good to be here today. Under any circumstances, it's good to be in this house of God. I uh, do give honor to God and to the clergy, to the family, Cecil, friends, and especially to my class, Cecil's class, Southern Wayne class of 80. We give honor to you. <laughs> Scripture for today is coming from 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13 uh, through the 18th verse. It's giving instructions about how we should be viewing death. It says, but I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you so much. Let's give an honor and praise for those scripture readings at this time. There's wisdom in scripture, but there's power in prayer. And at this time, we will have a prayer of comfort by Elder Tanya Gregory Hill. Let every heart pray. Our Father and our God, we first of all come to you, Lord Jesus, saying thank you. God, we thank you for this another day. For God, this is the day that you have made. And because you made it, we're going to rejoice. And God, we're going to be glad in this day. God, I know that we're at a home going, or what some people call a funeral. But God, we're at a home going service. God, and you said, God, that we should rejoice when they leave out because they're going to their resting place, their home in glory. And so, God, we come thanking you for the life, the legacy of Cecil Exum. God, we thank you for allowing us to have uh, met him and, and, and went on as family with him, God. We thank you. Father, now we pray for the family, our family. We pray for his, we pray for his children, Jamar and, De, and um, Dante and Tiara. We pray for Dez and we pray for Aunt Barbara, his mother, and Aaron, his brother, God. We pray, God, that after we leave this place, from where we have arms around us, God, and where people are speaking good over us, over him, God, we pray, God, that you will not allow the family to slump into a state of, of depression, into a state of feeling like we're lost, God, because, God, we can do nothing without you, God. All things are possible with you, God. Teach us, God, how to go to you and be humble and come to you in prayer and supplication, making our requests known unto you, O oh God. God, you are a deliverer. God, you are a mind regulator. God, you are a heart fixer. God, you hold us when we're, when we're in sadness, God. You dry our tears when we're crying, God. And God, we want to thank you, God, for being our comforter. We want to thank you, God, for being our peace. We want to thank you, God, for even in the midst of what it looks like, death being our joy, oh God. We still thank you, oh God. God, we pray strength upon our family this day. God, we pray strength upon his friends. 
We pray strength upon his, his, his uh, other family members. God, we pray strength upon every life that he's touched. Those that's in Australia, we pray strength upon them, God. God, for we may have feel like we lost a family member, God. But God, you've gained an angel. And God, we give you praise for his life. And we give you praise for ours. We ask you to bless us and we shall be blessed, God. Keep us, God, and we know we shall be kept. God, we give you praise and glory. Lift our heavy heads. God, soothe our heavy hearts. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and ask. And we thank you. Thank God. Amen. 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 We will now be blessed by a solo from Ms. Jawan Wilson, dear friend of the family, a hymn that I know will also bring us comfort. His eye is on the sparrow. To the family, the friends, and all his loved ones, I want to say that I am so sorry for your loss, and I know that God will bring good memories to the forefront in the coming days. And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus
Thank you so much. Let's give her another round of applause. While you read the obituary silently, and I hope I pronounced this right, Andra Mache Harvey will come and read it for us aloud. Life Will Live, Cecil Maurice Exum, Dudley, North Carolina, August the 7th, 1962 to July the 2nd, 19, I'm sorry, 2023. Know ye not that a good man does nothing for appearance sake, but for the sake of having done right, Epictetus. On July the 2nd, 2023, Surrounded by endless love and support, Cecil Maurice Exum, the epitome of a good man, transitioned from this world to heaven's bounty. He was 60 years old, and his departure had left an immense void in our heart, but his memory will live on forever. Cecil was born to Johnny Wayne Exum and Barbara Harvey Exum on August the 7th, 1962 in Goldsboro, North Carolina. He was a beloved individual who touched the lives of many. Cecil grew up in Dudley, North Carolina where he discovered his love of basketball at a very early age. His formative years in sports took place at Southern Wayne High School. It was there his legacy started to unfold. During his high school career, Cecil was a star both on and off the court. He was committed to academics and improving the school's culture. His fighting spirit was impactful such that in 1980, Cecil and his Victoria Saints won the North Carolina 4A State Championship. His star then began to shine brightly. He received the Most Valuable Player Award and had the extraordinary distinction of having his jersey retired by Southern Wayne High School, the first being done in the school's history. Cecil, highly recruited by universities across the United States, chose to attend the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. There, he continued wearing number 50, always with a big smile. At UNC Chapel Hill, Cecil was once again part of a winning team, the 1982 NCAA Men's Basketball National Championship team. His teammates and the coaches at UNCCH honored him for his invaluable contribution to the team by naming him the most inspirational player three consecutive years. After completing his matriculation, the sports and career in Chapel Hill, he was drafted into the NBA by the Denver Nuggets. Cecil continued his basketball career traveling the world, playing in Jokemok, Sweden, and finishing his career in Melbourne, Australia. In 1989, Cecil joined North Melbourne's Giants of the Australian National Basketball League and once again struck gold winning the NBL championship with the Giants in his first season. Success followed wherever he chose to travel. Upon finishing his career, he challenged himself with coaching and gained much pleasure from giving back to the game that afforded him such an illustrious career. Australia is the site of his greatest achievement. It was there he became the proud father to Jamar, Dante, and Tiara. 
His true joy came from spending time with his children. He was a devoted family man, cherishing every moment shared with his spouse, children, and looking forward to his first grandchild. Cecil's love and support were the pillars that held his family together, creating a bond that would endure even in his absence. Cecil will be deeply missed and fondly remembered by his family, Barbara, Aaron, Desiree, Jamar, Dante, and Tiara, as well as by his close friends, colleagues, and all those whose lives he touched in the USA and abroad. Cecil was known for his kind heart, jovial nature, and goodwill. He enjoyed time with the people he loved more than anything. He formed more meaningful connections in his time than most would over 10 lifetimes. We will continue to applaud him for his contributions to basketball and the development of kids who also loved the game as much as he did. In remembering Cecil, let us hold on to the beautiful memories we share with him. Let his legacy serve as a reminder to live each day with kindness, compassion, and a general, genuine love for others. Though we mourn his loss, we celebrate the life he lived and the positive impact he had on our lives. Cecil Exum will be deeply missed, but never forgotten. May his soul rest in eternal peace and may his family and friends find solace in the cherished memories they share. Rest in peace, Cecil Maurice Exum. Our tributes. We will first have uh, the president of Cecil's class, Ms. Laura Raper Bruden, and classmates, followed by Dr. Carlos Artis, a member of the Southern Wayne State 4A Championship team. Then representatives from the greatest university on this planet, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, of which I am a proud alumni. And we will then have acknowledgments by Ms. Lisa Wooten Core, a dear friend and also a member of the class of 80. Please come in that order. Southern Wayne Senior High School, class of 1980. We've lost a valuable class member, Cecil Maurice Exum. Cecil was the vice president of our senior class. Cecil's involvement in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, the French Club, the Tie Binder Yearbook staff, and student government showed his leadership abilities and his genuine warmth as a friend. As the class president, I had the opportunity to work with him a lot, to get to know him well, and to stand beside him on stage at our graduation where he stood quite tall, six foot six inches, and very proud. Cecil was a leader and a friend, and his leadership made others want to follow. As I reached out to our high school classmates in recent days, Memories of Cecil resurfaced for each of us. Classmates shared memories of Cecil, all of which involved smiles, good times, laughter, and hugs. One classmate aptly described him as, quote, smart, kind, humble, fun-loving, and living life to the fullest. He clearly loved people and actively showing his love, unquote. We cherish Cecil's presence in our class and reciprocate the love he so generously shared with each of us. One of my cherished memories involving Cecil was when we played Wilmington Laney High School at home 
in basketball. As a member of the girls' basketball team, attendance was often low until about the fourth quarter when fans started showing up for the boys' game. But when we played Laney, we were blown away. Coming out of the locker room to start the game, the gym was packed. Wow. Of course, they weren't there to see us play. They were there to get a good seat for the game that followed. The one with Michael Jordan playing for Laney and Cecil Exum playing for Southern Wayne. Now that was the real deal. Our senior year, Cecil and teammates led us to victory in the Dean Dome. We triumphantly brought home a state championship and his jersey was the first one to hang in our rafters at Southern Wayne. Many of the 1980 championship team have kept up with Cecil and his career at UNC and in Australia. For Cecil was one of us. We all bragged to our college friends whenever UNC was on the TV in the dorm. I'd say, see number 50? I went to high school with him. We were state champs. Cheers to the class of 1980. How many people can say they were a member of a championship team in high school, college, and professionally? Cecil could. Cecil's impact reached beyond the basketball court. He was a friend to many. His infectious smile brightened our days in the classroom. His laughter and his humor were contagious, often getting us into trouble. Being around Cecil just made you feel better and made you have a better day. As I reflect on Cecil's life, his roles as a friend, father, son, husband, player, and coach come to my mind. And I'm reminded of some familiar scripture from the book of John. John chapter 15 speaks of Jesus as the vine and we as the branches, that through him we bear fruit. Cecil was like a branch that supported and strengthened others. He was reliable. He understood the importance of friendship, compassion, and love. And these verses emphasize the significance of abiding in love, keeping God's commandments, and spreading joy to others. Hear now these words of Jesus from John 15, chapter, verses 5 through 12. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you could, excuse me, for without me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. And in verses 16 through 17, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. Verses 16 and 17 further reinforce that God chose and appointed Cecil to bear fruit, to lead us and to show us compassion. He exemplified this in his actions. He loved us and he cared for his family and his friends. And through his coaching, he touched the lives of many youth. Cecil was a wonderful friend to many of us. And as we mourn his passing, may we draw strength from God above to strive to be better disciples, letting others see Jesus in us. 
May we cherish the memory of our beloved friend Cecil Exum and continue his legacy of love, leadership, and kind-heartedness. Thank you. And now we have some special music by three of our classmates. Uncertainties about your tomorrow seem to grow. One thing you should remember and you should always know. Out of everyone who loves you, God says, I love you the most for I am just a prayer away call my name with your heart and I'll hear every word you say when you cry at night I'll wipe the tears away. Just pray, my love. I'll be there right away. When like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul it is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It, it is well it is well with my soul now y'all are watching us sing but on this last one we want you to sing Okay, so everybody stand to your feet. It is well, it is well with my soul. my 
my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Hello. First, I want to give honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank God for being here today. I thank the family for allowing me to speak. This is actually hard for me. Cecil and I grew up together. Cecil and my brother were the same age in the same class. Cecil's brother, Aaron, and I were in the same class in the same age. But we grew up in the neighborhood where there was a bunch of us. Uh, and we, of course, played ball. We had an area called the park. Really wasn't a park, it was just a basketball court. So I don't know why it was called the park. But we played every day in the park. And, and I have to say this, next to the park, was a utility building. And in the utility building, a little pipe came out of the utility building with an endless perpetual flow of water. And we used to play ball and then go drink that water. Remember that, Joe? But we never knew where the source of that water was coming from. So it's a wonder we all ain't got three eyes. But anyway, uh, 1980, Southern Wayne High School was a 4A champion. And it's good to see uh, some of the 1980 champions. I saw Linwood, JC, uh, Harold, uh, Greg. Uh, it's good to see them all. Uh, but at 1980, we knew we had something special. We knew we had a special team. But we didn't know how special it was. Uh, Back then, Southern Wayne was a 4A high school, which was the biggest high school. You didn't go any higher than 4A. That means the competition was great. In contrast, Southern Wayne is a 2A high school now. Uh, and we were in a conference with Goldsboro, which was our arch rivalry, Eastern Wayne, uh, Wilmington Langley, Wilmington New Hanover, Wilmington Harvard, Newburn. We were in a good conference. And Cecil was our leader. And of course, we started off uh, the season well. That year, we only lost two games. And we shouldn't have lost those two games. The coach fussed us out for losing those two games. But back then, I was <clears throat> the only sophomore on the team. The other players were juniors and seniors. And Cecil and I went to practice every day together. And uh, during the season, we beat everybody except for those two games. We even played a team down by the coast by the name of Langley High School. And they had a player that some of you may have heard named Michael Jordan. And while we were double teaming Michael Jordan trying to figure out what to do with him, they were double teaming Cecil trying to figure out what to do with him. And of course, we won. Uh, we beat them twice. Then it was time to play our arch rivalry, Goldsboro High School. They had a player by the name of Tichi, Anthony Tichi, 6'9", who went to Wake Forest and then to the NBA. And we went to Goldsboro High School and we beat them in triple overtime. And we were ecstatic. However, we had some tragedy. On our way home, three of our friends from Rollingwood who went to that game was hit by a train and killed. It affected us. Uh, it affected us. We questioned ourselves. 
it affected Cecil tremendously. Because Cecil was the leader, he was the leading scorer, he was the star of the team. Cecil took it hard. And he once said to me, why didn't we win in the first overtime? Why didn't we win in the second overtime? And he even said, why didn't we lose? Thinking that they wouldn't have died. But we been children, kids, adolescents, were not aware of the will of God. That was the will of God. It is okay to question God. Because even in the Bible, Job questioned God. And Job asked God why these things were happening. But God answered Job and asked Job, where was he when he laid the foundations of the world? Where was he when he flung the stars, the moon, and the sun in the sky? Essentially what God was telling Job was he's in control. Amen? Amen. So we continued that year uh, winning. Uh, we had a wonderful team. Uh, we had Linwood Robinson, who's here. He ended up the following year going to Carolina also. James Carlton was on our team. He ended up going to Appalachian. Greg Grantham uh, was on our team. He ended up going to Coca College and happens to be the college that I went to and played for. Uh, so we had, a, we had a good team. And we beat everybody. Then it was time to go to the playoffs. Nobody heard of this Southern Wayne team. Everybody heard of Chapel Hill, Greensboro. Nobody heard of Southern Wayne. And we caught them all by surprise. And we beat them, uh, all the teams going to the final. We went to Greensboro and played Greensboro Page. Uh, and we beat them. But again, we had some tragedy. Our lead uh, guard, Lenwood, had injured his knee and he was out for the season. Our next game was the championship game we would play uh, Chapel Hill High School. They were the big school. They were picked it to win. Nobody thought, knew about Southern Wayne, and uh, especially since our star guard was hurt. But they did forgot about Cecil. And we went to Chapel Hill, uh, and we beat them. Uh, it was... Uh, packed gym. Uh, I remember the coach asked me to go in the game, <clears throat> scared and excited at the same time. As Soon as I got in the game, they threw a trap on me and I threw the ball away. One of my players came to me and fussed me out. But Cecil came to me and said, take your time. And from there, everything was fine. Cecil went off, uh, excuse me, Cecil played very well. Um, and uh, nobody could check Cecil. Uh, Dante, your dad had some awesome low post moves. He was very quick and nobody could check him. Uh, and he was the MVP of the tournament. And we returned home. Uh, back in those days, we didn't get a ring. We didn't get a watch. We got a coat. A red coat with a basketball on it. But we appreciated that coat. And Cecil, of course, was the star of the team. He was awesome. But he never took it and become arrogant. He was always humble. He talked to everyone. He was friends to everyone. And I love him for that. And before I go, I'm going to say this. Cecil and I went to dinner. Before he went to California to go home. And at that dinner, we talked about everything. We stayed a long time. They were cleaning up. We were still there talking. We talked about death as one of our friends, Rod Davis, had just passed away. We talked about religion. But the one thing he talked about the most was his children. He talked about Jamar, who was back in Australia. 
he talked about his daughter, Tierra, who was planning to get married, and he was excited about that. And he talked about Dante, who he had just spent a month with overseas. And he showed me pictures and, uh, of his children. And one thing uh, got him upset. While he was overseas watching Dante in a playoff game, they were playing a team that they were beating. And the team got hostile. And one of the players tackled Dante on the floor. Cecil's whole continence changed. He stopped eating. He asked for it to go play. That thing made him hot. And he talked about that. Oh, that tackled my son. He said he cut up so bad he had to ask Jessica, Dante's girlfriend, to forgive him for acting up. But uh, that shows you how much he loved his children. And after dinner, we were not. We went outside and we hugged each other. And I told him I loved him. And he told me he loved me. And he left. I've been practicing medicine over 30 years. I worked in the emergency room for 15 years where I was the medical director. At no time did I see anything wrong with this. He was fine. I didn't see any red flags. But then he flew to California and um, Next thing I know, he called me, he FaceTimed me from the ICU. And he FaceTimed me every day from the ICU when the doctors came in the room so that I could talk with them and talk with him to help explain things. But then one day, he stopped calling. And I texted him, no response. And I texted him no response and then his daughter Tierra had arrived and she was gracious enough to keep me updated but I want you to know I love Cecil he was a good friend and I pray that the family stay strong and know this is God's will God is in control and we as people have to get under God's will, everybody, because it's time. And I thank you for letting me talk. I don't know who will be coming from UNC, but if you'll come forward now. You notice he didn't mention what team y'all lost to that year, but I'll just let that ruminate in the room. I think it begins with a G, though. Okay, is that enough? All right. <laughs> My cheat sheet. I'm David Daly, one of the managers on that 1982 team you've heard about, and uh, one of, I guess, uh, our unofficial reunion managers, along with Ralph Meekins, David Hart, and Chuck Duckett, as we tried to get together here and there over the last 40 years. After college, Cecil and I reconnected in 1991 when I was working on a book about the 10th anniversary of that 82 team. I remember that first phone call and the voice on the other end. A mix of Eastern North Carolina twang. I'm from New Bern, so I'm familiar with that accent. And, uh, and now Cecil's Australian accent that was thrown in there. I'd never quite heard that combination before. We talked for about an hour. Seemed like we just picked right up since the last time we'd actually seen each other. Later, I did give him a little grief when I got my phone bill. That was an expensive call. I said, next time you're calling me. So. 
because being in Australia, CECL was not able to make our organized reunions over the years, but we did have our, what we called our CECL reunions whenever he would be back in North Carolina. Whether it was he and I meeting at a restaurant here in Goldsboro, or a bigger group of us in Chapel Hill, or more recently when Jimmy Black Cecil and I got together in, in Raleigh, it was always special to catch up and fill in the gaps between the years. And I recently thought about our 25th reunion we had back in 1997, one we shared with the 1957 UNC championship team who was celebrating their 50th anniversary. And one of their teammates had passed away. And I know Ralph and I had, had looked over there and I think we all took notice and wondered what our group would look like at 50. Then last year we had our 40th anniversary reunion for the 82 championship. And Cecil was finally able to join in that weekend of celebration, thankfully. It was great to see us all together again. And I know he really enjoyed the time and recognition that he was able to spend with all of us as, as we enjoyed spending the time with him. As we were walking off the Smith Center Court after a, a brief ceremony to recognize the team, Michael said, you know, we don't have to do this big deal to get together. We can just get together, smoke cigars, and hang out. And that had started me thinking, yes, he was right. We don't have to wait for some anniversary to try to all get together. It's more about that personal time behind the scenes, telling our stories, both old and new, not all the pomp and circumstance of a big public event. But now, well, here we are again at a, at a big event all together, and we're still telling our stories. We were telling them, early, telling them earlier, and they do seem to get better with age. But I think the message here is, we don't need an occasion, an anniversary, an event to get together every time. Make the effort to stay connected, make that phone call, expensive as it may be, send a text, hop in the car, grab lunch or dinner, smoke cigars, because you just never know. That 82 team and the 81 guys too, we have an unbreakable bond that has lasted us for over 40 years. There's a reason for that. And our teammate Cecil's friendship, camaraderie, his personality on and off the court is a big reason. A great example why we've all stayed so close after four decades. And the next time we all get together, whenever and wherever that may be, we will miss Cecil so much. But we will not forget him and what he means to each of us, to our team, and the Carolina family. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Linwood Robinson. I was a teammate of Cecil at uh, Southern Wayne High and at uh, UNC. I'm going to make this uh, short and sweet because my I uh, first encountered Cecil. You know, we were. I was in eighth grade, he was in ninth grade. And uh, we went to Brogdon Junior High. And I knew it then. He wasn't get the player that he was, but what he would become. But what Cecil had as a player, and everybody here can know that, dude had some hands. I could throw that ball with a blindfold on, and that boy, he would catch it and finish it. Any kind of way, he made me look good. He uh, he could pick him up and put him down. What I mean by that in basketball jargon is he could run. He could run the court. He could board. Never bragged. Never had a big head. Just did it. He was also disciplined. He was an academic achiever and a hard worker. And we ran in completely different circles, but we were friends through that ball, through that basketball. But we really connected last year, reconnected last year when we had the uh, reunion. And we uh, had some email correspondence, and I, I just cannot believe this has happened. I, okay, I, I, gotta, I gotta go. <laughs> So as a team, when we found out that Cecil was sick, we immediately started a text chain. And so we'd keep our teammates 
surprised about what's, what's going on, and we really didn't know, but we all prayed and hoped he would make it, and we found out he didn't. It started an emotional text chain that we talked about Cecil for the last two weeks, uh, and that's everybody on our team was on that chain, and there's some things about Cecil I didn't even know about it. I didn't know that he was a huge soap opera fan. The young and the restless, or as Sam Perkins, his roommate, said, the, the young and the ish, whatever that means. I don't know what that, what that means. But when I was talking and thinking about this and thinking about Cecil, you know, Cecil's career at Chapel Hill was not as great and as grandeur as it was here at Southern Wayne. And by the way, Linwood talked about how Cecil made him look good, and he did because when Michael Jordan and Linwood came on their recruiting tip, trip to Chapel Hill, everybody was talking about Linwood and not Michael. That's true. But Cecil, when you think about it, what, what describes Cecil the most during the four years we had with him, or I had three years with him? It's one word that kept coming back to me and coming back to me and in some arenas it may not be perceived the, the way that I see it. But uh, I was thinking about it, and last night I was watching Family Feud, Steve Harvey, and the question was, if we polled 100 women, what would they want in a husband? And there were like seven or eight responses, some of which were good-looking, rich, uh, smart, tall. Nobody said the number one answer. And the number one answer was exactly what I was thinking about Cecil Lexington. Sweet and kind. You know, he won the most inspirational. Uh, we, the, the team gave him that award. You saw that in his obituary three years in a row. You don't, that doesn't happen. You don't get an award three years in a row. He was the heart and soul of the team. He didn't start, and, he, and he, he let us know he wanted to start, and that's a good thing. But we don't, and at that time, didn't live in the transport, uh, transfer portal world. He stuck it out, and it helped him down the road because when he got to Australia, he was able to show his, his wares, and he became the Michael Jordan of Australia is what we heard back here in the States. The only, but, but given to his sweetness, I mean, he was as kind of a human being as you'll ever meet. He was as sweet of a person as you'd ever meet. And sometimes in our society, that's not a, that doesn't get you far. I mean, let's face it. But for him, it did. And his, his family was it for him. Uh, when he did come back on one of our Cecil reunions, he talked about Dante. Dante was thinking about going straight to the NBA or going to Carolina. And boy, I was there in his ear thinking, if he was going to go to college, let's go to Chapel Hill. Let's, just, let's do this again, because we wanted him there. I wanted him there. You know what he talked about? Tiara and Jamar. He talked about his other children he, and what would be good for them. Would they be close? Could he, could, could, if he does go to college, could he go to a college where they could come to college? I mean, that's what he was talking about and thinking about. So he loved you dearly, family. He was the sweetest man, one of the sweetest men I've ever known, and I know that carried over to his family life. Uh, one last thing I'm going to say, and, and, he, and I've, I've told him this a few times, and he chuckled. I don't know how much he likes, is going to like me telling the story, but it's a story. It's a Cecil story. We were, it was 82-83. It was after we had won the national championship, and we only had one senior on the team. James Worthy had gone pro. The only senior on the team was my roommate, Jimmy Braddock. And when we would have pregame meals at, at Carolina, Coach Smith would always have the senior, a senior, give the pregame prayer. And Jimmy was our only senior, and I don't know if Jimmy wasn't there or if maybe Coach Smith got tired of Jimmy's prayers. But unexpectedly, out of nowhere, he said, Cecil, I want you to give the prayer. And as, we, as the other teammates were bowing their heads, I, I knew better. I was looking straight at Cecil the whole time. <laughs> and I know where Cecil is right now. He's in a better place. And I know his roots because he began to pray. And I don't know if you've ever seen a petrified person pray before. <laughs> But here's how it went, and I'm going to end with this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. 
And then as Cecil realized that everyone was looking and, and laughing, as a low, low laugh, because we knew if we laughed loud, Coach Smith would have been all over us. He realized maybe that was not the right setting. So he finished with, Our Father who art in heaven, <laughs> hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. And that is a true story because I witnessed it. Uh, my name is David Hart. I was a manager also. Cecil was in my class, so we spent four years together. Um, rotten trees do not bear good fruit. And so the Exum family, y'all must be awesome. Because Cecil was one of the finest specimens of good fruit I've ever seen. He was a good man. He was a sweet man, and Ralph talked about that. Uh, as a man, sweet's not always what you want to hear, but the sweetest man that ever lived with Jesus. And if you can be like that, amen. A um, couple of quick remembrances. Cecil was extremely competitive, and even what was at the time the starting lineup for the best team in the land couldn't stop Cecil because in practice every day he made those guys look bad and they would tell you he was one of the hardest people to defend that they ever had to defend he earned the nickname IHOP because he had such a quick first step and then he was up and you couldn't stop his shot he was awesome extremely competitive he loved watching the first team run because the second team had beaten them in practice. And it happened fairly often. Cecil and Sam Perkins and Matt Doherty were in my class. And we happened to be up in Asheville, which is where I grew up. Um, and so they came over to spend the night with us. And my sister and her husband and their their, my niece, their daughter, who was about two at the time, came over to eat with us. And so is my mom and dad. Um, a side note, Cecil did not like tea. Um, he did not like, I see somebody shaking their head no. He did not like tea. My mom did not know that, and my mom served Cecil sweet tea. But my mom make sweet tea with like 12 teaspoons of Lipton Instant, a can of frozen lemonade, and an obscene amount of sugar. And Cecil came up to me after and said, that's the best stuff I've ever had. <laughs> and the greatest joys of the last couple of decades have been, for my mom, have been when I would see Cecil and he would say, how's your mom doing? And tell her I loved her sweet tea. And so I've been doing that whenever I've seen him. I've tell, told my mom, and fortunately she's still with us. Makes her day. Anyway, my niece Amy walks into the kitchen, and she's about this tall. Well, Sam Perkins is standing there, and she looks at his knees. And all of a sudden I see her head. And it would be like, from my perspective, if I'm looking at his knees, his head's up there at the speakers. <laughs> she took in the whole measure of the man, this enormous man she'd never seen before. They spent the evening with us, and then we spent the night and we left, and Amy got to play with Cecil. Cecil talked to Amy, he cut up with Amy, and Amy, for months, didn't talk about Sam. She didn't talk about Matt. She talked about Cecil because she saw the full measure of the man. Not the height, but the man. God sees the full measure, and he accepts us whether we deserve it or not sometimes, but there's this amazing thing called grace. And I know where Cecil is today. Heaven is a little bit brighter because one of the greatest smiles and one of the greatest laughs I have ever seen is up there today. But it's left our world a little darker. 
and I'm going to miss my friend. Before we have our acknowledgments, we will have one more, um, one more remark from Pastor Roland Whitley, cousin of Cecil. I'm actually not that guy. I'm oh, Kenneth Ward. Ward. Um, so, that is Kenny and so Carol skipped my name on the program, but that happens when you're not an athlete, so I'm sort of used to this. So giving honor to God, Reverend, I feel really honored, Exum family, to be at Aaron. The last time I saw you, brother, was 83, 84 Granville Towers at the pool. I'm not even going to talk in church about what we were doing back then, brother. Um, but I'm honored to be here, especially as a non-athlete, because um, y'all wear me out with all these basketball memories. Um, but it's interesting, though, because that unites us. And I think one of the things that I know about Cecil is that he united people. On the back of the program, there's an amazing poem by Maya Angelou. And one of the things that I think about when I think about Maya Angelou is that she says, people will not remember what you said, they will not remember what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And you've heard people, like tons of folks, for a really long time, talk about how Cecil made them feel. And Cecil made people feel good. Um, I met Cecil uh, my first day in Chapel Hill. It happened to be my birthday. Um, so I went to Chapel Hill on August 15th, and that was my birthday. And I made friends that first day in Chapel Hill. We call them day ones because they're friends for life. And it was people like Bernadine Austin, Craig Jones, Vance Cavanis, uh, Helen Little, Penny Cremati, Gwen Waddell, just amazing, brilliant black folk that were just extraordinary for a little guy like me coming from Enfield, North Carolina. And our association with Goldsboro was a mental hospital. So I used to joke with Cecil about that, like, you crazy because you're from Goldsboro. Um, so, and then I met this woman, well, she was a girl, a young lady at the time, Kathy West, and she introduced me to her homeboy, Cecil. And I just knew out the gate, we were gonna be friends. Like I just knew, when Cecil and I met, I was like, we're gonna be buddies. And as I said, it was my birthday. His birthday was the week before, so we're both Leos. And you know how Leo, we're just the greatest people on the planet. So it's like, we're gonna be friends. And we were. And you know, in, Ch in Chapel Hill, we say this stuff like Tar Heel born, Tar Heel bred, when I die, I'll be Tar Heel dead. But when you meet people at 18, you never imagine that here we are and I'll be standing up speaking at his home going service about this life well lived because that's what he did. He lived a life really well. Um, and Carolina gave us so many experiences and because we in church, I ain't gonna talk about those experiences, right? Because I, it was Purdy's and Four Corners and He's Not Here and Granville Towers and Great Hall and we hung out and had an extraordinary time and we were safe. And we grew and we loved each other and we created relationships that last a lifetime. So whenever I see Cecil the next time, we pick up like we just left. And y'all need to get hip to WhatsApp because we talk on WhatsApp, you don't have to pay for it. Um, and, and it's crazy because with the advent of technology, we got to talk more and he talked about the kids all the time. Like he talked about his family. Miss Barbara, he loved you. And that was one of the things I loved about him because I love my mama. Right, and she put, she put in the work to make me a great man. And so Cecil and I had that in common. So our love of our mothers and our families, because people who don't like their mamas, I don't really hang out with them. Because I think there's something wrong with you. Like you don't like your mom, like you, if you have bad relations, like I got some crazy cousins, but I don't like, not like my whole family, right? And he loved his family. And Aaron, you know this because you were in Chapel Hill hanging out with us like you were in class almost sometimes. I thought you were in school up there, bro. And so, I, about four years ago, we've been talking. He's like, I'm coming to the States Christmas. They're like, yo, I'm going to be in Harlem. He's like, I'll be in New York. We need to connect. Okay, let's connect. We connect New Year's Day. He said, uh, our friend Helen, who's an air, on-air personality, I guess I don't call them DJs anymore, she's an on-air personality. Um, she's in New York, but she's staying out in Jersey. He's like, go with me to see Helen. I was like, bet. Cecil picks me up in Harlem, we go out to Jersey, we hang out um, all day. 
I don't think I've laughed so hard in so long. We laugh. Cecil and I drank. Helen was doing the dry January, whatever that is. Um, Cecil and I drank. We laughed. We talked. We laughed. We ate. We laughed. We laughed. We just laughed. And he said at some point, he got this really serious look. He was like, you know what? None of my friends ever come and visit me in Australia. He's like, y'all should come. Bro, I got a passport. <laughs> so when? And so Helen and I, that day, we decided we were coming to Australia. Uh, two months later, we show up in Australia. He rolls out the red carpet. Uh, it's insane. Um, I met Rodney, like all of his friends. These people love Cecil. Y'all think y'all love Cecil? These black people in Australia love Cecil. They love him. They worship at this man. And he took us to vineyards. We drank good wine. We went on a boat. We, went, we just did everything. And then one night he had like a rooftop party for us and brought out all the expatriates. Like all these people who were living in Australia, they came out, they celebrated us. And they celebrated Cecil. Like they loved him. And it made me glad to see that my friend was in a space where he was so loved. Because we would talk about Chapel Hill, right? Because he wasn't a star. And I don't compare him and say he was like somebody else. Because I know them other players. They could never be Cecil X. They could never be him. His spirit, like that thing that he has, they, sh they could have a billion dollars. They can't buy that. Like that heart, that goodness. You can win rings, you can have money, and people might say stuff to flatter you because they want some of your money and your attention. But I don't know any home going ceremony for any Tar Heel, and you all can correct me and check me if I'm wrong, where somebody can stand up here and say this stuff about Cecil for any other player from that team. Because Cecil was a good man. He could have been arrogant, and Dante, he wasn't. I've never seen your dad try to make somebody feel small. I've never seen him do that. He had every opportunity to do that. He, the first year, we were national champions, runner-ups. The next year, we won the NCAA championship. He was on that team. He could have made people feel small. He never did that. That's not who he was. That ain't who that man was. He made people feel good about themselves. That's who he was. And so I call him King Cecil, King Cecil. The K, because he was kind. Everybody's talking about how kind he was. Cecil was kind. Um, I think about Jesus. He was meek, he was kind. Cecil was kind. And I've seen that kindness, that smile. I've never been in that man's presence and didn't leave him and feel good about life, feel good about myself and the world in which I live. He was kind. And God knows we need more kindness. Um, we talked about he was intelligent. He was inspirational. Cecil inspired people. Everybody can't inspire folk. You can challenge people and buck up, like, yo, I'll see you in the paint or whatever and stuff like that, but he inspired people. And that's who he was. He was inspirational. Um, he was noble. I've seen him go through some challenges and just vicissitudes in life, and he kept his head up. That smile was still going. He kept his head up, unbowed, unbroken. He was noble. And Cecil was generous. I talked to Dorothy's son, Aaron, and he talked about how Cecil poured love and wisdom and fatherly affection in him. So many people know that he, I mean, he gives stuff, anybody can give stuff, but Cecil gave his time. He gave his heart, he gave his love, he gave his energy. That's who he was. He's a king. And, and I'm just reminded, you know, in life, we can value different things. And what you value, that's up to you and your God. I know what I value. I value people who treat me good. I, draw, I value people who are kind to me, people who respect me, people who love me unconditionally, and people who show up for me. Those are the folks I want in my team. 
I'm reminded that in West Africa with the Ashanti, they have these Adinkra symbols. And there's one symbol, it's a ladder of death, and that's what it's called. And the ladder of death is a reminder that all of us will climb the ladder of death, all of us. Cecil has simply climbed it before us. And it's a reminder of our humanity, because all of us gonna climb it. You can think you got it, you can think you got more money, you can think you got more rings, you can think you got more cars, you can think you got whatever, but everyone climbs the ladder of death. And it reminds of us, it reminds me of the reason why we should be humble. So when you do die, people can come and talk about you, they can say the truth. Ain't nobody got to stand here and lie about this man. Nope. Tierra, nobody has to lie about your daddy, baby. Your daddy was a good man. And when I was in Australia, he called y'all every day. Every day he called y'all. Every day he's on the phone talking to y'all. Every day. People can talk love. People show love. Y'all know your dad loves you. Y'all gonna be okay. It's gonna be hard, but you're gonna be okay. Because love is eternal. And the spirit never dies. And so in this quest to chase rings and to chase championships, Cecil chased a crown. He chased a crown, and he got that crown for a life well lived. I do a SAT word of the day, because I'm nerdy like that. And the word of the day was coronation. I'm driving down here from DC. The word of the day popped up, and it's coronation. And I'm like, yo, I'm talking about Cecil being a king, and the word of the day is coronation. Ain't that a godsend? And so I'm sure that Cecil's having his heavenly coronation. He's got his crown. He's got his crown. He's got his crown. I'm convinced of that. Everything in my body tells me that brother has his crown. And there's nothing I can say to put him in heaven or no place, because I don't need to say it. What I can do is stand here and say, Des, I love you. I love your family. Miss Barbara, I love you. Aaron, it's good seeing you, brother. I'm sorry for your loss. Cecil was a great man. He was a king. Long live King Cecil. I pray that as he's joined the ancestors, that he is at perfect peace. I pray that those of you who say you love him, that you will continue to mirror the light and love that he gave so generously, and that's the way his spirit stays alive. Um, I thank you for this time. Um, I thank you for allowing me to speak. I love this man. Um, yeah, it's good people. And in the words of Maya Angelou, don't forget People gonna forget what you said and what you did. They are not gonna forget how you made them feel. So take some time out, make somebody feel good and uh, live a life so when this is over, regardless of how many Audis or houses or whatever you got, um, you get your crown because that's what this is about. Um, thank you. I would never, ever, ever leave out Kay Ward. I did not recognize you. And I'm glad you spoke. Purdy's, Four Corners, I must have been in the library. I don't, I don't remember these places. We will now have our final tribute from Pastor Roland Whitley, cousin of Mr. Exum. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have to correct something. I'm, I'm thankful to be here, but um, um, uh, go Pat. Go Pat. Um, for those of you who understand, go Pat. Um, Cecil was my cousin, and I'm glad to be here. I just want to bring protocols in place, but I'd like to say um, I love you, I'm Bob. Where does one find peace? When you're the first to take the lead, where does one find counsel? Moses had his brother Aaron. David had Jonathan. Paul had Barnabas. But where do African American men who come from rural places who are the first to show us the way? who are the first to travel in the dark, harnessing their own fears, who did not choose the path, but learned that, the, that his path 
for him had already been ordained before he was even in his mother's womb. Those plans that have been ordained have touched many of our lives. Those that will be watching online and even in person with us today. And that is a true testament of the word not returning void. It was through you, my cousin, that we have found good counsel. When you are first, where does one go to find grace and mercy? Being first has its advantages. We got to enjoy your success. We marveled as you tore up the high school athletics to secure your first 4A state championship with your beloved Southern Wayne High School. We got to share through you the first national championship victory of that legendary coach, Dean Smith. We got to travel with you through the world as you traveled over 10,063 miles from Dudley to Melbourne, Australia, of which many of us did not know or had never heard of. We got to learn what commitment and dedication really meant by following your own ordained path westward. We are reminded that no matter how far you travel, no matter how far or how long you may have been away, we learned that you stayed the course. You learned how to follow and complete the mission. Your DNA forever flows, my Lord, through our veins. We got to share stories of what life is like internationally, leading us to get our first passport and, and also traveling to go see the world. Thank you for holding it down for us so long to, to move us to a place of appreciation and a better understanding why you was driven to follow the path that God had already preordained for you, even before you was in my Aunt Bob womb. Hmm. I learned that God had already showed you mercy and grace since your birth. And we can see it very clearly as we saw those who talked about you and how your life had manifested in their life. But beloved, I, I still, I still, I'm struggling with this question. Where, when you are first, where does one find peace? When you're first. Cecil was the first in our family to be born. So have you ever heard of the phrase, it's lonely at the top? Yep, it's lonely there. Because when you're first, you find yourself fighting battles by yourself. It doesn't necessarily mean that because you're first, you're, you're a leader or, you, or you're supposed to lead folk. You just find yourself fighting battles alone when you're first. Yeah, but my cousin Cecil didn't really walk around, as everybody said, boasting about things that really didn't matter. Because when you're first, you learn how to fight certain battles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did the honorable thing and, and allowed us 
you want to be exalted, let other people talk about you. And he allowed us to speak to his accomplishments. When you're first, you are, and you begin to be the standard in which we all must learn how to live to. Yeah, 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 you force us to, to really be conscious about the decisions we have to make. And those, you have been first to make those decisions. And so we have to look up to you because you were the standard. Yeah. But never in this process do we understand that the leader often has that moment. You see, when you're a leader and you're first, you, you, there's something in the process that you go through that, 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 that you got to find your peace. Because everyone seems to become your priority. Your children, your wife, your job, your career, teaching and helping other people, it seems to become... But look how far you came, boy. From walking and, and working in those tobacco fields, picking beans and cucumbers, from per perfecting your, your skills in that park out in Dudley and rolling wood, from having children and raising them as a father should do. You didn't have to do that. But when you first, you learn that that's the standard in which you must do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. From standing tall like you were uh, with that flat top high fade. The boy must have been walking through airports and they like, oh, I seen this brother back in eight. <laughs> and now we see better though. We, we, we see you better. Mm. Because of the manifest manifestation of your good counsel. Yeah, we, we, we see how grace and and mercy revealed itself to you. We see when it's time uh, to find peace in a world which forever seems to take and take and take and take. Yeah, you were the first of our generation. You were the first. And, um, and we understand that, like the brother said, you got to climb a ladder. But we all know we're going to all get our turn. But I just say, wait a minute, grasshopper. I still got some more time. So I said, rest easy, my cousin, and find your peace. And they say this all the time. Y'all may know this, and I'm, I'm going to take my seat because I got yet another coming behind me. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Amen. Beloved friend, Lisa Wooten Core and classmate, will come and give our acknowledgments. Good afternoon. The family has received numerous expressions of love from Wayne County, Australia, Serbia, and alumni from both Southern Wayne and UNC Chapel Hill. There are too many 
cards to read, but the family would like you to know this. We deeply appreciate the many expressions of friendship extended to us during these sad hours. Your concern, love, and numerous acts of kindness are most sustaining and shall be remembered. Your compassion will help us accept the will of God. We pray God's richest blessings upon each of you. Lovingly, the Exum family. When great trees fall, Maya Angelou. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder. Lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants slumber at the, safe, at the safety when great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us become light, becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly. Our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promise walks never taken. Great souls die, and our reality, bound to them, takes leave of us. Our souls, dependent upon their nurture, now shrink, wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutter unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms slowly and always irregularly. Spaces fill with the kindness of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restored, never to be the same, whisper to us, they existed, they existed. We can be, be and be better, for they existed. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have had the pleasure this week to have in my home Cecil's children, their significant others, and my dear friend Des. Never have I met more lovely, lovely children, and they are just the epitome of what we as mothers want our children to be. So at this time, in remembrance of their father, Tierra, Dante, and Jamar, will bring a tribute. First of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone being here. Um, I know I don't, I don't want to be here, so. But on behalf of me and my family, um, this is by far the hardest thing you know we've had to go through, and it's still, to this day, it does not feel real. Um, I'm sure it does for everyone in this room. Um, I've stared at my phone for multiple hours looking at photos, videos, everything, trying to write something that I feel will you know, do him the honor. Um, and nothing seems to do good, but um, I think today we'll try. Um, but first, I'll um, chair uh, prepared something, so I'll let her go first. Sorry. It has taken me a while to write anything because I didn't want to face the reality of this. To many, he was Cecil, or Cecil, as that's how his name was commonly pronounced in Australia. But to me, he was my daddy, dad, and pa. 
and he was the best dad I could have asked for, and I'm so grateful that I'm his daughter. I would love to honor my dad with a poem I wrote for him. As you know, my dad's full name is Cecil Maurice Exum. He'd always say to me, my initials are C-M-E, as in see me. So I've titled this poem, See Me. Everything reminds me of you. Your smile lights up a room. Your laugh, infectious. I can hear it. I miss it. I do. Memories to hold on to, to get us through. A life well lived, you made, were raised to be the greatest father one day. Your mother, your brother, they're so proud. Devoted, you are a heart so big, you always had lots of love to give. The family you created will live on through generations, from North Carolina to Australia, a legacy, a legacy so vivacious. Everything I do reminds me of you, because I see me in you. Thanks. Um, so, my dad is the reason um, I fell in love with the game of basketball. Um, and from a young age, he only ever wanted the best, you know, for me, my brother and sister. I can remember when I was young, after games, I, like, I hated getting in the car with him, you know. I think, it, as all kids do, um, with parents. But it's because I knew every time I get in the car, he was going to take every little thing about my game. Um, but that was just how he was. He just wanted the best for, for any of us. It hasn't been until these last two years where I finally understood kind of what he was you know, trying to do for me and, and make me become the player I wanted to be. And so, you know, being, being in Europe, that was kind of where it started. Um, he would call me after every game and we would, we would chat. Um, I know when Jessica wasn't with me over in Europe, she knew um, an hour after the game, it was devoted to time with my dad um, and we would talk about everything that happened in the game. I will miss those conversations, um, but I know he'll be guiding me through my future games. Sorry. He was the, be he was the best dad that any one of us could hope for. He, as, as everyone said here, he lit up every room that he was in with his big personality, his presence, smile, and laugh. I'm glad and will cherish the last two months I was able to spend with him in, in Europe while he watched me play. And truth be told, um, at my last team, he was actually more famous than me. I don't know if anyone saw. Um, <laughs> they celebrated him more than me. Um, so no, I'm, I'm glad he was just able to, you know, be celebrated one last time. Um, and, you know, thank you to, to them. They, they loved him out there, um, I think. Being out there, it was just everyone asking questions. He was getting interviews. He, he loved it. Um, <laughs> uh, he had so much to look forward to, and, and, and this is why this hurts so much. If I'm able to be half the father he was to us, to my little girl on the way, I know she'll be in good hands. He raised me to be the man I am today and gave both, uh, both of us the strength to carry on the Exum name. So once again, thank you all for coming out here. Um, and I'm glad to see everyone here. And I know he would love to, uh, to have seen everyone here and he loved all of you guys. So thank you. Now you can see firsthand what I'm talking about with these young people. They are surely lights in all of our lives, but Cecil's heart. A life well lived. We've heard a lot about it. A lot of us have been an integral part of it. But Pastor H.A. Gregory III will now come and give us inspiration in that vein. Every home-going service I have ever done, I take an opportunity 
over this last 30 years to gain something from the life of the person which I'm talking or preaching or talking about. And it never fails that every time I stand up to say something about the person, everybody else has already said everything. And I'm grateful for that because I struggled with this moment only because Cecil had a broad life, a big life, past Roland Wood, past Dudley, past Southern Wayne. It was the kind of life that all of us would dream to live. And I have learned so much about cuz today. I won't bore you with the same said uh, four of the things I have written down. So thank you, Kenny. To God be the glory. I won't have to repeat those things. But I'm, gla I'm glad to be able to stand with my family. Cecil and I were first cousins. And as it has been stated by my other cousin, that he was the first cousin to be born out of the sisters that my grandparents had. And Cecil never let us forget that he was first. He was first in everything. But Cecil was caring. And that's what I want to talk about just for a few minutes. Everybody has already said, amen, most of what I was going to say. So I'm just going to, amen, go through this very quickly. But Cecil was a caring person. He lived the life that God wanted him to live, caring for people not because he was taught by a seminary or learned it in school. He just did. Philippians 2 and 4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We have learned today that Cecil spent his life caring for others. Matthew 25, one of my favorite scriptures, talks about three parables, the third of which Jesus says to a man, his disciples, that when I was hungry, you did not feed me. And when I was thirsty, you didn't give me any water to drink. When I was in prison, you never came to see me. When I was sick, you never visited me. When did we not do this and saw you Lord when we did not do it to the least of these but those who have when they did it to the least of these then you've done it unto me Cecil has spent his life doing it unto the least of them and I believe in my heart that was a call that God had on his life Cecil was a man, the life of the party, as uh, Kenny talked about. A man, he was a very, 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 very um, lively person. There was never a dull moment with Cecil. It was always funny as kids watching him and Aaron fuss about everything. A man, uh, it was very, 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 very funny to listen to Cecil tell dry jokes and laugh at his laugh because that's the only thing that was funny. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Cecil was extremely proud to be the best of all the cousins, ne nephews, nieces, and grandchildren. And I was just, it was just something to hear him and Aaron fussing about who was going to get the biggest piece of meat that Aunt Barbara had cooked for dinner. Cecil would always use the excuse, the biggest one is mine because I was first. Cecil was well celebrated. He was celebrated by so many people. He was from one of the countryest places around here, but everybody knew him. Everybody celebrated Cecil. He was very popular and loved the attention because and he loved the attention because he felt like he deserved every bit of it. 
But he never was, as has been stated, arrogant. Even in, in the small park, in a small community called Rolling Wood, in Dudley, North Carolina, they loved Cecil Exum, Terry and Tony Vick, Sheila Boot, Gene Eason, the Russells and the Suttons, Pop Royal and the Artist Brothers, white people, black people, everybody loved Cecil Exum. Amen. Joe and Kent Hayes, all of the fellas and brothers that we grew up with, we all had a chance to see someone from our community celebrated by his own community. It was also mentioned that Cecil was inspiring. I just want to say to you, it's easy to encourage people to do, but it's very hard, as has been said, to inspire them to do. Amen. Some people are good at encouraging, which means they know how to push you along. But very few people can set the example and pull you right along with them. They inspire you to be better. Cecil was smart. He inspired us to read more. He inspired us to be the best as he graduated from Southern Wayne, one of the best in his classes. Amen. When I was, when I was talking with Cecil, I loved following Cecil. I just told Coach Davis a few minutes ago before the thing, I am a Tar Heel born, Tar Heel bred, and when I die, I'm going to be a Tar Heel dead. I love Carolina Tar Heels because of Cecil. I would go with Aunt Barbara and Aaron to every game I could that was at home in Chapel Hill on Tuesday and Saturday. I spent time on the hill, amen, with Cecil and the fellas. Sam Perkins was my favorite player other than Cecil. And Cecil allowed or asked him, convinced him to come to Dudley, North Carolina to be my 16th birthday present. And I had a chance to walk around and be with Sam Perkins all day on my birthday. He called me to Aunt Barbara's house and he says, I got something for you. I drove, I, well, I rode my bicycle around there, amen. And I went in the door and the door wouldn't open all the way and it was so funny because he felt like Sam Perkins was going to surprise me. But Sam Perkins was taller than the door. So I saw him coming in the door like Sam Perkins. And everybody was like, you spoiled a surprise. I was like, he is taller than the door. And I got a chance to walk around with him in my small neighborhood of Rolling Wood. And I was the man because I had Cecil Exum and Sam Perkins walking with me. Rolling Wood was so small, of course you know it didn't take but an hour for us to make it around. But yet he was my opportunity, inspired. I was upset with University of North Carolina, the Tar Heels, because I felt like my cousin deserved more playing time. He was the man down here, a man in North Carolina, in Goldsboro, I mean in Dudley, in Goldsboro area. They had, Cecil gave these boys a fit down here, trying to see how to stop him. And he was only, he grew up to be 6'6", but in those days, Linwood will tell you, he was about 6'4", wasn't he, Spence? He wasn't that tall. And he gave Tichi a fit, every one of them he gave a fit. Even Spencer, both Spencers, he gave them a fit down there in the paint. And I was, I was telling Cecil one day, I said, Cecil, Transfer. One of the coaches or trainers talked about the transfer portal. I said, transfer, man. I want to see you on the court. You deserve to be on the court. And Cecil told me, he said, cuz, let me tell you. He says, I want to graduate from a school as prestigious as the University of North Carolina. He said, every ring that Michael Jordan and Sam Perkins get, I get. Every time they cut down a net, I cut one too. But I'm going to have an education from one of the greatest schools in all of college. 
And I could be inspired by that because he was loyal. And I thought it was about playing time. And it wasn't about playing time. It was about his opportunity to be a better person and graduate from University of North Carolina. Those are just a few things. Carol, can tell, uh, Carol and Des can tell you that this opportunity gave me a fit because I didn't know what to say. And I appreciate all of you who came before me because you have explained in its totality the life a man well lived. But let me tell you before I go, family. Amen. The songwriter says, time is filled with swift transition. Now, I listen to y'all talk about Cecil. Y'all told a whole life story. Amen. I was clapping when y'all said it. I said amen when y'all said something I was familiar with. Now I'm going to just give you a little bit of this Bible because Cecil believed in that too. So y'all come on and say amen to that as well. Amen. Family, there's a song that says time is filled with swift transition. Not on earth unmoved can stand. Build your hope on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. I like the hook. It says, everybody ought to hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Building our hope, Dante and family, on things eternal. Holding to God's unchanging hand. Because as we can see today that God's hand, his prevenient grace has been upon Cecil's life from day one. And every time God's hand moves, you never understand how it's moving. You just have to move with God's hand because God's hand is that kind of hand that will lead you to the places in which you ought to go. Had he not been to Carolina, had he listened to me, he wouldn't have never met Des. Dante wouldn't have never been Dante. He'd have probably been somebody else. And he had, he had the hand of God on his life. And I wanted to remind the family, as I just try to encourage you, in this next two minutes, I promise you I won't be long. Everybody ought to hold to God's unchanging hand. <laughs> Lest I hold you too long, let me leave you with this. Amen. The cost of being alive is dealing with the death of loved ones. Often we will go through this because we are climbing the ladder. And yes, it will be our turn one day. And everybody in here will have to face the same thing that these children and our cousins and family is facing today. And we have to deal with this kind of adversity. But Liv, if you don't know how to deal with adversity, you don't really know how to live. Because adversity comes, amen, and it makes life better every one of us have been able to rebound from situations that we thought were unfair every person in here amen got a little higher every time something happened amen every one of us in here were able to grasp a little better and understand a little more about life when you go through hard times we are going through a hard time right now and I'm telling you my friends and I'm telling you my family if we can hold to God's unchanging hand he He's going to, through the life of our cousin, make life better for all of us. It will be better. Yes, you and I will be okay because we understand the move of God is just what that is and we know how to face this kind of adversity. Everybody has to go through this and everybody has to recover from this. God wants us to know that weapons will form, but they won't prosper. There will be some ups and some downs, some trials and some tribulations, some good and some bad days, but God is working it out for our good. There may be some trouble along the way, and you might have to cry sometime. But the songwriter says, Jesus will fix it. After a while, is there anybody here who knows Jesus will fix it? 
after a while, life is full of process. Process, amen, is sometimes hard. It's sometimes filled with tears and pain. But process is the battleground on which we get to the promise. Everybody has to go through process. Life and death is all about process. And one day, we will all wear our crown if we can get through the process. The process is what life is based on. And Cecil went through the process. Lastly, but I want to tell you this. Amen. Amen. Not only is it the process is the testing ground for the promise, but from day, amen, from the day we are born until the day we die God is working on all of us and he promises us that through the thick and the thin he will finish the work for us like he did for our cousin. God will finish the work and he will do it so people can see and talk about who he was in us. Be strong family. Occasions such as this are often the depth of our wilderness, but God. Somebody say, but God. We are going to, amen, be heartbroken for a while, but God. Some days will be worse than others. There's, but God. The road ahead, amen, will get a little dark and a little weary, but God. Amen. The songwriter says this, and I'll leave you with this. There's a song that says, like a ship that's tossed and driven, battered by an angry sea. When the storms of life are raging and the fury fall on me, I wonder what have I done to make this race so hard to run. Then I say to my soul, take courage. The Lord will make a way somehow. I just want to ask a question before I leave. Does anybody here understand the prevenient grace of God and his hands moving in our lives? God is always making a way somehow. Can you help me encourage my own family? If you understand and know this for yourself by just simply waving that right hand of power and saying in the atmosphere, the Lord will make a way somehow. To God be the glory. I wish you would look over to two or three of your neighbors and say the same thing. God will make a way somehow. We have to get together, family, and hold to God's strong hand. God's, amen, comforting hand. God's hand that is ever loving. God's hand that is ever embracing. We have to face the fact, amen, but God will lead us and guide us and comfort us with his hand. Everybody ought to hold to God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to build their hope on things eternal. And we can sing like Cecil is singing right now. Amen. After we've lived our life, we can say like he's saying, I've had some good days. Lord, I wish I had one or two of y'all that didn't mind at least churching with me for a whole second or two. And I've had some bad days. And I've had some hills to climb. But when I look back over my life, all of my good days outweigh my bad days and I won't complain. Look over and tell your neighbor, we can't complain. We were blessed with Cecil. We can't complain. We were given a gift by God from Cecil. And now God has taken him away. But we've all had some good days. And, and, the, and Cecil is still saying, amen. So, amen, nobody can love us like God. So all I can do is just wave my hand and say, thank you, Lord. I won't complain. Thank you, Lord, for the good days. Come on, thank you, Lord, for the bad days. Come on, thank you, Lord, for the trials and the tribulations. Thank you, Lord, for the ins and the outs. Thank you, Lord, for picking us up and turning us around and helping us along our way. Amen. I won't complain. Cecil won't complain. I pray you don't complain in Jesus' name because he lived a life well lived. Amen. 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 Amen.
saints and friends. Let's say one more amen and one more round of applause for that awesome word of God. I now come to give closing remarks. And as a person who is a teacher by heart, an educator, I find myself without words. And that's hard to do. Don't make that face in there. Because I'll throw a word of the day out at you, Kay. But I do think at this time, there are too many memories to share. And if I shared them, Diz and Sherman, I'd have to kill you. So we can't share those. But know that Cecil and his family are a big, big part of my life. But from what we've heard today, he's a big, big part of many lives. Our gentle giant, our loving friend, our precious brother, husband, and father, a great athlete, a great humanitarian, and a great Christian. I do want to leave with the family that the Lord is close who are brokenhearted and saved as such those who are crushed with sorrow for sin and are humbly and thoroughly penitent. He is close to us right now. I know God is with me right now because I got through this today. And I thank you. I thank you for everybody in here who prayed that this celebration would be what Cecil needed it and deserved it. So Des, Aaron, Miss Barbara, Tierra, Dante, and Jamar, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. He will get you through. Because Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Join with me. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. I now turn the service over to the able hands of the Rhodes Funeral Home who will give us some final remarks and Pastor Gregory will give us our benediction. Thank you for your patience, your kind love, and all that you have expressed today. Friends, if we can go ahead and put our hands together, let's give God a hand clap of praise.
for this life that has been very, very well lived. My friends, I would like to take this time to echo the sentiments of the Exum family and express gratitude and say thank you to the minister of the, ministers of the gospel, Dr. Artis, our presider of today, you for those most wonderful words of comfort passed down to the Exum family. I do stand with the family as we do say thank you, thank you, and thank you for those most wonderful words of comfort. To the many friends and guests who took time out of your busy schedule just to come and attend this homegoing celebration, whether flower, phone call, text, but most of all your prayers. My friends, the Bible tells us it is the praise of the righteous that availeth much. We do stand, I do stand with the Exum family as we do say thank you for every little thing that you've done. To you, the Exum family, I stand here today in memory of our founder, Mr. J.B. Rhodes Sr., and on behalf of our president, Mr. J.B. Rhodes III, just to simply say thank you for considering the Rhodes family to service you, the Exum family. And it is our prayer that the services we have rendered to you over these last past few days have been that of a satisfactory in every respect. Family, I do leave you with let not your hearts be sad, nor shed your tears in vain, for there's a price to pay. The prophets say when heaven is the game. So please don't mourn for Mr. Exum, for truly he is well. For what harm could come to those who rest now in a home where only angels dwell? My friends, at this time, we prepare for a final viewing in the vestibule of the church. We do ask that you do trust and bear with us as we do prepare for the final arrangements. May God bless you. May God keep you. May peace be with you all. Thank you.